It's a potpourri. We watched season five, episode 10, The Cigar Store Indian. <laughs> When you were editing the last episode, you sent me all of the YouTube, all of the names that YouTube used for us. Mm-hmm. Um, At one point, it started referring to us as Dr. So-and-so and like Dr. Someone Else. Like it just, the the subtitling service does its best, but. Why are they giving us crazy names? I don't know. But the one that comes up all the time is Stacy and Bowen. Mm. So I think we should just change our names. Are they trying to like voice match us to other people? Oh, maybe. If that's the case, I'd really like to hear the podcast by Dr. Galen Henson and Dr. Janelle Lampkin. I looked up Dr. Galen Henson. Does not, not exist. <laughs> what about Janelle Lampkin? I didn't look her up. <laughs> so you want to talk about this thing or? Other names that it fo- called us are Krista and Brennan mm. and Drew and Shira. Which I think. Yeah, Drew and Shira, power couple. <laughs> do we have to talk about this episode? We don't have to do anything. This is our podcast. So, okay. How about we just do this right at the start? This episode has offensive things in it, mm. it's also about how offensive it is. Mm-hmm. So, we don't have to keep like convincing ourselves that. We don't find it funny because we're good people, right? Like, let's just get that out of the way. Jerry said offensive stuff and then tried to make up for it. Kramer said offensive things. The the whole thing is in bad taste, but they know it is. I don't know. I have other problems with this episode. Well, we can talk about them. First off, this episode was written by Max Prost and Tom Gamble. Who? Uh, They wrote one episode before this, um, but they write a few every season until season seven i think or seven mm. or, it was directed by tom sharonis it aired on december 9th 1993 screen crush ranked it as the 107th best episode mm-hmm. vulture.com had it as the 45th what i almost want to read the descriptions because you have to what does larry fitzmaurice say about this ye of listicles and buzzfeed quizzes the Scar Store Indian, like the Diplomats Club, it explores racial issues, this time by having Jerry accidentally, yet repeatedly, offend a potential Native American love interest. Also, George's father's TV guide collection is a sight to behold, and don't forget to stick around until the end for the incredible Al Roker cameo. I don't think you can tease an incredible cameo, but then say who it is. I think we might have to change the definition of incredible. <laughs> yeah. Comparatively, ScreenCrush.com, Scar Store Indian, nearly a one-act play on the subject of obsession. There's Frank Costanza's fixation on his complete collection of TV guide, kids, ask your parents, and the guy who finds the guide Elaine takes and his fixation on Elaine, plus Elaine's boss's fixation on a statue that belongs to Kramer. Frank confronting George over the condom wrapper he finds in his bed is one of the show's most exquisitely awkward moments. I like that synopsis and ranking better um because they're right it is it is an episode about obsession among other things i was almost thinking like that george Mm storyline i think like there's enough there that that could be an episode that was that was very funny and while i was watching the episode it was like switching between scene to scene to scene to scene to scene my so my fast. notes are half a page because yeah. I just wrote down too much is happening, too quickly, hard cuts, can't write it all down. So I feel like these guys wrote this episode uh, separately. Mm. And then they're like, well, we got to we got to mesh them together. Yeah. Yeah, that was my big problem with this episode was structurally it is jarring. That was your big problem with this episode. <laughs> okay. That was my other big problem. <laughs> I don't have to read the synopsis because that's it's all been said. I think – I was thinking about the Netflix descriptions and I would like them to be a little more cryptic. I feel like they're too – this happens and then this happens and then this happens and mm. then this happens. 
Like you need like a TV guide level of... level description, mm-hmm. something to to tease and get you to watch without giving it all away. Do you do you think Netflix is just like we don't need to put in good descriptions because nobody reads the descriptions. Possibly. You know, it's not a it's not a needle mover. It's like um We know you're gonna watch this anyway. Especially like especially for a show like Seinfeld, where it's like a yeah. show that's like, you know, thirty years old. So So why have it at all then? Well I think you you have to have it in case somebody mm-hmm. reads it, but then if you don't know what Seinfeld is, I don't know. <laughs> they don't need to fix it because nobody reads it. Except us. Okay, I'm going to stop reading it then. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll find the TV Guide description of each episode from now on. I don't know if I can do that. Just call them. (laughs) I need to find myself a collector. Mm -hmm. We have uh, the name and address of a collector. He's got all the fall preview episodes. Those are his favorite. He's been collecting them since the beginning. Since the beginning of what? TV Guide? Or TV? Since they've been doing fall previews. Oh, okay. So should we talk about this episode? Wait. Stalling. Who are the guest stars? So we have Kimberly Guerrero playing the part of Winona. She was in Longmire, Reservation Dogs, The Glorias, and she was also a voice in the English dub version of My Neighbor Totoro. Oh. Or My Neighbor Craig. Uh, when they were releasing that film in Western markets, they were, the, you know, distributors were debating what to call it. Anglicizing the name of yeah. Totoro. Um, and the name that the, the studio that was distributing it came up with was Craig, my neighbor Craig. And the creator was like, I would not want to be called Craig. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to keep it Totoro. Sam Lloyd played the part of Ricky. The man who was obsessed with Elaine. Mm. He was uh, in Scrubs, Galaxy Quest, and Desperate Housewives. Well, I think I recognize him from Galaxy Quest. I mean, if you had watched Scrubs, you would recognize him from yeah, Scrubs. Yeah, well, I didn't watch Scrubs. Stay tuned uh, after we finish up Seinfeld for <laughs> Scrubs cast. <laughs> I didn't watch House either. Hmm. Would I rather rewatch House or... I mean, I didn't see all of House. I think I've seen all of Scrubs. Maybe? I don't know. Hmm. Isn't this exciting? You have so much TV to introduce me to. Is Scrubs on Netflix? It's somewhere. Maybe on Crave? We also had C.K. Stiefel, who played the part of Sylvia. Who's that? She was the woman with whom George oh, oh. Uh, drank prune juice. <laughs> so she's a little bit more of a producer than an actress, but she was in. Can't read my writing. I love that one. I really can't read my writing. She was in the second half. She was the voice of Usyk, the Vanilla Sunday, in the Ace Ventura video game. <laughs> she was also in the movie Frankenhooker. That she's not the first person from Frankenhooker who's cameoed on Seinfeld. You sure? I don't think so. Because Who's in Frankenhooker? Well, we got to look it up now because. I recognize that. I'm going to be honest, none of these names are jumping out at me. (laughs) So the opening stand-up is about how you can tell the best year of, you know, your dad's life or an old man's life based off the style of clothing that he's wearing. He just, like, he gets to that year and he just, like, continues on. He doesn't stop buying new clothes. Somehow somehow he finds new old clothes. (laughs) Uh, So I've heard my sister and my mom talk about this theory that women lock in their style the year that they get married. Hmm. I don't think you can look at what anybody's wearing post-pandemic mm. and make any conclusions. Unless everybody got married during the pandemic and it's all, you know... The best stretch, year of their lives. <laughs> stretch pants and uh, oversized hoodies. Hmm. Would you say that I wear the same clothes that I wore when we got married? Never mind that they don't fit. 
but the same style. <laughs> Essentially. I guess because I don't have style, so it's just like... Are you still wearing black tank tops? I have fewer of them than before. <laughs> okay, but point taken. All right, what's your style? What's the best year of your life so I far? Know, jeans and a t-shirt. Hmm. So, when you were eight? As a kid, I did not like wearing jeans. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I mean, I never see you in them now, so... I don't have a pair that fits me anymore. <laughs> I just bought a pair of jeans today. Hard pants. What brand were they? Katie. There you go. Spelled my way. The, that wasn't the brand. That was the, like, style, like, the mm. the model or whatever it's called. I don't remember what the, the brand was. But I, I feel like I can't take the tags off because it's got my name on them. Technically, they're Katie boyfriend jeans, so, I mean... Who is he? I'll kill him. This might be worth it. It might not. Husky boys. <laughs> Skinny prices. <laughs> so we're still on the stand-up. So the gang has gone bowling. Is this the morning? Did they go for a morning bowl? Mid-afternoon bowl, I guess. Jerry's drinking coffee? Mm-hmm. The, so this whole episode starts weird. The four of them are in... George's parents' house. Yep. So already we're thrown off kilter. Mm -hmm. And Kramer's not in the shot in the beginning, but they're there and they're talking about leaving there immediately because only they got to go somewhere. It's like nothing nothing happens in place for any amount of you're time. You're like entering the conversation like halfway through? Yeah. Yeah. So you're trying to figure out why are they there? Wh what were they doing? Where are they going? I didn't realize they had already been bowling. I thought they were going bowling. Like, just sloppy. Hmm. I guess it could have been better explained. I don't need it spoon-fed to me. But, like, I'm not enjoying it if I'm going, what? Hmm. Kramer comes in as he, he's eaten some soap. I, I also had thought he had eaten the, the soap. Oh, he didn't eat the soap? I don't know. They, <laughs> but they were... George was not that he had used the guest yeah. soaps, but did he come in and say, are these candies? I think he had tried to eat the soap. That was such a classic, like, mid-90s, a, a little formed fancy soap of a shell or, mm. like, a little cherub Flower, or something. Uh, yeah. yeah. I can smell that soap. Mm. Does it smell like potpourri? If you were to mix it with... Dandruff? Uh, dandruff and kasha. Kasha, mothballs cheap carpet hmm. that is basically baba's house yeah i can smell that right now yeah it's kasha kasha i believe is roasted buckwheat or what's the stuff that you put on your uh, granola i like uncooked buckwheat yeah kasha is roasted buckwheat but then do you make like a porridge out of it i think so oh i don't like that because it smells like baba's house <laughs> There's a huge bowl of those strawberry candies on the coffee table. Mm. And also giant glass grapes. Were those grapes? I think so. They were like bigger than golf ball sized grapes. Yeah, they were like pool balls yeah. in a bunch, but with a stem. It was, it was grapes. Mm. Useless glass uh, centerpiece. Yep. Think how many coffee table books you'd fit on that coffee table if you didn't have the glass centerpiece. Mm. So this is the first time that we hear about a coffee table book about coffee tables. I'm assuming it's not the last. How big of a storyline do you think they make it? Well, I've heard of this. Oh, okay. So I, does it go beyond this season? Oh, it goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was going to say, Jerry puts his cup on the table without a coaster and leaves a ring mm -hmm. they don't need to take it to a furniture place they no. can just put a hair dryer to it there, there's no attempt made to fix it themselves well maybe they didn't know this but i mm. i didn't know this until a nice table of ours had rings on it and someone mm. was like oh you just, you just hair dry them out and it works well, there you go George, being a bald man, might not own a <laughs> hair dryer. His mother probably does. She probably took it on vacation to wherever they drove to. She probably has one of those giant ones that you put over oh, your head. Oh, yeah. Like to set your curls. Yeah. yeah. They could just set that on the table. Hmm. So my next note is $3 gyros. 
<laughs> Looked like a good gyro. For three bucks? I think that's a good yeah. deal. Yido. Yido? Well, $3.93, that's like a $9 Yido now. How much does a Big Mac cost these days? I don't know, but we were at a hockey game where if the Senators scored three goals, you got $3 Big Macs, and I'm like, aren't they like $4? <laughs> well, you save a dollar. What's the deal with the Raptors and pizza? Don't you get... What's the deal <laughs> with the Raptors and pizza? Don't you get a slice of pizza if they score 100 points or something? Uh, I don't think that's the case anymore. Oh. Now I think it's something to do with the number of three-pointers they get. Oh. Do you get $3 Big Macs? I don't know what you get. Speaking of saving money, on the subway... The poster behind Elaine and Kramer says, pay less tax without having to declare yourself a church. And it's an Ikea ad. I wondered if it was an Ikea ad, because I think they put tape over the little Ikea logo. Yes, Yes, you could tell. Hmm. Um, But when Kramer moved his head, you could see Ikea in the text at the bottom. And it was like a tax break just on Ikea stuff? I don't know. Didn't we... For this podcast, look up when Ikea came to America. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Around that time, I think. Yeah. Right? It was like during the beginning of Seinfeld. This is this was like, yeah. it's like getting started years. When they had to advertise, I guess. I imagine Ikea still advertises. They aren't Coke. <laughs> they do. I'm sure they do, but do they have to? When I was in Maldives, the villa that we were staying in was owned by the Ikea family. Wow. Is their name Ikea? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Was it furnished with Ikea? It was not. <laughs> I don't think there's too much Ikea in Maldives. Well, you could bring it. It's going to be underwater in 10 years anyways. <sighs> Sad. think your boyfriend's going to miss the train. This was one of the points where there was so much going on, and it was so weird that I didn't. I stopped writing. And I think I just sort of like my eyes opened wide at this creepazoid. You see, on this Tuesday here, you could have watched six hours of Lucy. <laughs> it's a man who uh, just loves his TV. He loves his TV, and he instantly loves Elaine. We'll find out. We'll find out. He comes back too. Yeah. Oh. Forgot don't it. spoil it. Yeah, sorry. In the antique shop, first of all, also, you don't take your your furniture to an antique shop to be repaired. You take it there to sell it, don't you? They could do repairs as well. I guess. So back in the antique shop... Sylvia. ...comes in late, and the owner of the shop yells at her, and she has a, a very, like, New York Fran Drescher kind of mm. accent and style, and she immediately likes... The boys with the nice car and is sort of flirting with George and uh, admires his coffee table. And he says, you know, we see objects of great beauty and we must have them. And that line works. Are you saying in this case it works? Or like, hey, that line works. Well, potato, see potato. objects of great beauty. I hope prune juice is all right. It was the only thing I had chilled. There's there's so many signs, like, you know, is this your son in the bubble bath? Like, prune juice, a lock on the liquor cabinet. How, how does this woman not clue in? It's the... But also, what normal people put a lock on their liquor cabinet mm. if their adult son is living with them or not? You know, like... There's a lot of things going on here. Just like in this episode, maybe she's just overwhelmed with the kasha smell and can't mm. process. George has just swept this woman off her feet and she... Uh, she's willing to ignore mm, all of it. Anything? Yeah. So then we're at Elaine's. She's playing poker with her friends, Winona, Joanne, Renee, and someone else whose name we didn't get. They're all wearing suit jackets. Like they just came from work. They're business women. Yeah. I guess it's, but it's, it's not a work day because Elaine was bowling all afternoon. Yeah, so why are they dressed like that? It's fashion in the 90s. Ugh. So uncomfortable. Um, 
I can tell something is going to be bad when your head turns to me. Oh, I was totally just of watching you. <laughs> looking at the TV. I want to see your reaction to what's going on. I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I, in my mind, I remember it worse. How is that possible? Mm. You have to give Jerry credit that he recognizes he messed up. And yes, he's trying to date Winona and. That's his motivation for better behavior. But he's he's catching himself from saying things that are offensive. This is true. What's funny about that, though? Him, like... Uh, hmm. I called ahead and made arrangements. Yeah. M- my problem with it is when, like... I hear the audience laughing. I don't know what they're laughing at, right? Because they could be laughing at the awkwardness of the situation, but they can also be laughing at the inappropriateness of the situation. No, I think they're laughing at the awkwardness. Mm. I I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that this is a good episode, but I I see what you're saying that like Jerry, Jerry does like he recognizes fault. He's, Doing it for disingenuous reasons, but he's willing to do it. <laughs> Last episode, I said Jerry's a terrible person. Hmm. This one, um, he's working on himself, you know? For sex. <laughs> sure. Okay. So I wrote, I'm just that, that meme of the monkey puppet looking sideways and mm. then looking forward. Yep. This whole episode. I'm going to make that the uh, the image for the Instagram post. Hmm. So Jerry's gone over to Winona's to to smooth things over, and she does not invite him up, but mm-hmm. uh, she will come down to the street to talk to him. Mm-hmm. And he kind of, you know, says, you know, that's not who he is, and if she spent any time with him, she'd realize that. Upon which uh, Kramer drives by and performs some ululations. Mm-hmm. Uh, and before is that before or after? I don't know. Jerry if that's before asks or after. the uh, mailman. If there are any good Chinese restaurants in the neighborhood, the mailman being Chinese mm. takes offense to this. Mm. I think that when I was a kid, I didn't under- like. I was like, "Why would you ask a mailman?" <laughs> I'd ask my parents that, and my dad was like, "Well, he works in the neighborhood, so he knows it." And I'm like, "Oh, that's why." Like, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get the good reason to ask the mailman. <laughs> well, being a child, you don't get much mail. So, I mean, I'm an adult, and I don't get much mail either. So. <laughs> When George's parents come home, he goes, how was your trip? Ah, your uh-huh. father. <laughs> you laughed out loud at that line. Yes. I think that was the only time you like, even like, ha, at it. <laughs> the episode. What is this? A prophylactic rapper? So the, the, the George story should be the A story. I think this is a good George story. Yeah. I think it's a strong, solid, you could carry an episode with this. Absolutely. But also, did George dye his hair? Did Jason Alexander dye his hair? I don't think so. It looked very black in this episode. Mm. How does so it through end? a series of circumstances, Kramer ends up at Pendant Publishing and yeah. pitches the coffee table book about coffee tables to Mr. Lipman, who thinks it's a fabulous idea. And on the cover, there'll be a coaster. You're You're, you're much more diligent about coasters than I am. I don't really think we had coasters in our house growing up. Uh, I like our furniture. Okie dokie. <laughs> Maybe because I brought the furniture into the relationship, so mm. I'm diligent I with had coasters. that blue couch. That was a great couch. Uh-huh. Which you gave away. Yeah. Oh, remember? Do you remember giving away that couch? <laughs> Do you, we should tell that story, because that's way more entertaining than whatever we're going to talk about about this episode. Yeah, so... Your wonderful couch, which came from your parents' basement when, you know, 15, 20 years ago. 20, 22, 25 years ago. Yeah. yeah. That we couldn't fit down the stairs into our basement. So it's hopped around upstairs Mm -hmm. and been moved around. And it was in my office most recently. And no one was sitting on it. I was just tossing things on it. And I needed space. So we we finally decided that we were going to get rid of it. And uh, I couldn't sell it, so I just gave it away for free. Trash nothing. Someone said, I'll take it. Uh, I'll be there, whatever, Saturday. I'm like, gave the dimensions. It's going to fit. Yeah, 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 it's going to fit. So 
we lug it down the stairs and we have it, you know, right, right at, right at our front door, mm-hmm. ready for whomever arrives. They can pick it up, throw it in whatever vehicle they bring. This is like January, right? Oh yeah. It's like full on winter. So we couldn't just chuck it outside because it would get snowed on. We were, we were on our way to an afternoon hockey game mm-hmm. and they were coming at like one and we were like, if, if, they aren't here. We'll just like leave it outside for yep. them. And if it's gone when we come back, like, great. That's what we want to happen. Yeah. Would you like to describe the person that shows up in the vehicle that they're in? So the person who shows up has, I've, you know, decluttering, I've been giving away a lot of stuff. She had picked up something from me before. I never met her, but I had to leave it on the driveway because she couldn't, she, she couldn't climb the stairs. We have three steps. Up they're, to our front door. They're kind of they're kind of awkward steps. They're big steps. Baba couldn't climb our steps. Anyway, I was kind of like, okay, you're going to pick up the couch? Like, mm-hmm. but her son and her son's roommate were going to come help her. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, She pulled up in like a 2009 Ford Edge mm-hmm. with a completely flat tire. Three wheels. She gets out of there, uh, driver's side. 65-year-old woman with a medical cane, nobody to help her put the couch in the car. Yeah. So I said, okay, get your shoes on, Derek. We're going to move the couch. So I filled her tire with air. <laughs> we popped her trunk. The trunk did not stay open by itself. Oh, we no. had to prop it up with like a hockey stick. Yeah, she had a special stick for it. If you're not familiar with the Ford Edge, it's not the longest of vehicles. But we put a you know full-sized couch. You know, the, the back hatch did not close. No, but, I mean, it's heavy enough. It's not going anywhere. And immediately after I had filled her tire and filled her car with the couch, her son and his friend showed up in a Toyota Yaris. Which was full of, like, Ikea shelves that they had picked up. She was getting it for their apartment, you know, for kids' first apartment, da-da-da. But I'm always surprised, like, if we have a thing that we're getting rid of, the the small vehicles that people think... What was her plan? I don't know what her plan was. Do you remember when we got rid of the L-shaped couch and those kids showed up in a minivan? Yes. And they Tetris that into the minivan. They did. I was really impressed. Well, maybe this wasn't more entertaining than talking about this episode. I think it was. Hmm. Don't underestimate a family vehicle for its cargo and stowing capacity. If you're showing up to pick something, pick up a, a free something at somebody's house and it's a big something, show up with somebody to help you lift it. Yeah. Especially if you're a 65-year-old woman with one leg. She just thought our street had a lot of potholes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're like, no, ma'am, your tire is completely flat. <laughs> How far did you drive? Oh, follow-up story. She told me, unsolicited, that she bought a new car. Good for her. I'm making friends in the, in the free cycling community. <laughs> Wasn't that what your play was all about? Yes. Let's not bring that up. It's coming true. You oh, look yeah. scrumptious. I didn't recognize Al Roker. because Oh, at the end, yeah. Because I know skinny, older Al Roker. Yeah, he had, a, he had, um, he had the band or he had yeah. gastric bypass surgery and yeah. now he's like skinny guy. Yeah. He's still doing weather and stuff, isn't he? I think he's so. still like a figure he's, in the news. He's still a figure. All I have left is stand up. Uh, the, the only other note that I really have is uh, these are worth like a lot of money. <laughs> Which are, there's so many things that are like that. It's like you collect whatever you know. You have the entire set of this. Uh, this really reminded me of my grandfather's house and um, Reader's Digest magazine. Hmm. You know, the the little quarter size one, same size as like the TV guides, mm-hmm. that. And then there was a uh, a stack of magazines at the kitchen table that in my mind we used as a chair because <laughs> it was like chair height. <laughs> and we just sat on the Didn't you the slide around? And <laughs> I, I, I was young when, uh, when this happened, like, you know. No, no high chair. Just stick Derek on the stack of magazines. Yeah. I was thinking about their house, um, I can't remember why, but they used to um, winter in Florida. They were like snowbirds. 
and somebody would like come and check on their house every three days. And one time they came and they opened the door and the like heat coming out of the house just like hit them like they'd opened like uh, an oven. Yeah. And the e- furnace had malfunctioned and the house had just gotten kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. <laughs> To the point where, like, candles that they had had, like, completely melted. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, All over the Reader's Digest? Uh, maybe that's why we got rid of them. That sounds like our car. The temperature works in our car. The vent changing doesn't work in our car. No, the temperature is stuck on above high. Mm. So, like, 30 plus degrees to the point where I can smell melting plastic. I don't think that's true. And it only comes out the like body vents and it won't change to the defog or the floor vents. Mm -hmm. So if you want to defrost the windshield or, you know, get rid of fog, just get a blast of hell breath in your face. Well, you like going to the spa, so it's kind of like a sauna. So yeah, the closing stand-up is about the TV guide. It is the most thrown reading material in the world. Never handed, always thrown. That's it. Did you ever get TV guide? No. I got the thing in the Toronto Star. Yeah. Star Week. I did like looking at it, but that's when TV was, you know, small. I never looked at it to kind of plan what I was going to watch, but I would definitely look at it. You just like watch whatever's on. Of course, but... Like you were wandering aimlessly. (laughs) Roaming around the dial. But you might look at what's on like Sunday night. Mm, True. There was always like movies or some special thing. Yeah. Now what's the point? Why do they even make it still? You gotta you gotta talk about the biz. Hmm. You gotta interview uh, up and coming uh, weathermen. <laughs> so hey, next week we have the conversion. Mm-hmm. What's that about? You'll finally find out why Kramer is a Kavorka. <laughs> okay, I can't wait. So I have some corrections from last week. Hit me. We were talking about women being obsessed with a serial killer oh, yeah. documentary. It was Zac Efron as Ted Bundy. Oh, yeah. He's a good-looking man. He's a good-looking man, I guess. Um, Wait, Zac Efron or Ted Bundy? <laughs> <laughs> potato, potato. So, Sheila Eisenberg, the author of the book Women Who Love Men Who Kill – completed one of the most substantial surveys of women who fall for killers. Many of them were intelligent and friendly. What distinguished them was their history and psychology. Every woman had been abused in her past. Hmm. I was wondering if maybe it's, um, you know, women, women like certainty and the thing that they're afraid of, like, you're like, Oh, this guy, I don't know if he's going to kill me or not, (laughs) but at least with a serial killer, you know what you're going to get. Uh, I I could go on. Essentially, by getting involved with a prisoner, these women were regaining control in their relationships. Mm. They dictated when prison visits were made. They would put money in the canteen. The killer would be dependent on them, appearing to reverse the power dynamic. Mm. Also, one of the basic human needs is to be known and acknowledged. Who would write you back who's famous? Nobody. But a prisoner would. That's all I got. That's it. Okay, well, we we pretty much avoided talking about all the bad stuff. Bye-bye. Bye. How come you didn't play the music last time? Believe it or not, this is our podcast. Please subscribe at the end. If you subscribed, we would be happy. Please subscribe to us. Believe it or not, it's our podcast. Is that a Seinfeld reference?